Okay, Pastor John's away today. We have a very special guest and speaker today. His name is Jack Thomas. Jack comes to us from Camp Cove. He's the executive director down there at the camp. He's also a pastor in the United Baptist Church. Um, Jack is just a, he's an awesome man. He's very active in the Mays community, in the Christmas community. It's my understanding that Jack does play some guitar, but he decided not to bring it today. But maybe next time. Maybe next time. And he threatened to maybe pick this up during the service. So we'll see about that. But um, would you guys give him a good welcome? Right now. now Tuesday's going to be Veterans Day. And it's, it's important to honor our vets, to honor those who uh, went away and served. Some of them didn't come back, so we need to take that time on Tuesday and just honor these guys and lift up a prayer to the families. Are there any vets here? Ladies and gentlemen, hallelujah. Um, some of the announcements I have, again, John's not going to be, Master John's not going to be here, so. He's tasked me with this, with this uh, announcement thing. Um, this Sunday celebration, November 30th, 10 o'clock in the morning. If you come at 11, you're late. If you come at 9, you're early, but it's 10 o'clock. There's going to be a, a pretty, sounds like a pretty awesome worship service to you. The kids from the, the folks from Teen Ch uh, Challenge is coming, and they're going to bring the choir, and it just sounds like it's really going to be a cool day of worship. But that's on the 30th. Heavenly Perks is coming up again. It's uh, November 15th. And, uh, and Perks is um, it's on a Saturday, of course. Doors open at 6 30. New, new membership class is uh, coming up on Sunday, November the 16th at 1 p.m. in the chapel. <coughs> Pastor John's going to be uh, leading that, so be sure to get a hold of him if you're interested. If you're new to the church and you want to become a member, you know, connect with Pastor John. The annual Thanksgiving meal on Thanksgiving Day, right here at the church from 12 to 4, I believe it is. It's, um, now, I don't personally come to it, but if I understand it, it's just an awesome time of serving uh, the community, of the church coming together and just uh, you know, sharing a meal and worshiping God together. So that's, again, Thanksgiving Day. And that day there is the 27th, between 12 and 4. And then the last announcement I have is about the uh, Urban Promise Luncheon for Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. The church is gonna provide a lunch for the inner city kids of the Urban, the Urban Promise uh, Academy. Um, they're going to cook the meal today up, up here in the kitchen, and then on Tuesday from 11.30 to 12.30, if anybody's able to come in and help serve these, these kids, it would be awesome. Just a, a way to show um, Jesus Christ with our hands and with our feet. Just to prepare our hearts and our minds for uh, God's tithes and offerings at this time, and I would like to, to offer up a, a, a short prayer. So would you guys just bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, Lord, we just give you all the glory, Lord, and all the praise, Lord, as these songs say, Lord, and all the people say, Amen. Let us always be willing to lift up our hands and lift up our voices to you, God, for you are, you are good, and you are true, Lord, and you are just, and we just thank you and we praise you, Father God. Lord, thank you for everything that you've given to us, all the gifts that you have given to us, Father. And Lord, now we have a, uh, a couple moments here to give back to you, Lord Jesus, in the way of the tithes and offerings to the church. Father, I just pray that you'll bless this time. Lord, that, uh, that your other folks just understand that uh, it is a blessing and it is good to give back to you, Lord. You'll take it, you'll multiply it, you'll increase it, Lord, to, to do your work here on the earth uh, so that we can get to as many people that, that, we can, that we can get to, Father. Those that need to hear from you, Lord Jesus. There's so many. It's a broken community. We're not here in Claymont, but across this great nation, across the world, Lord. And uh, we are the light, Father. So use us. And bless us during this time. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. And what's really neat for me, and, and, and I think all you guys that, that read the Bible, of course, when it's written in red, it's you, those are the words that Jesus himself has spoken. So this is just such a privilege, it's such an honor to do this. When the Son of Man comes in, his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. 
He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king replied, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. It's good to be with you. Would you indulge me for a moment? Okay. Um, I want to take a picture of you. Um, so I can, uh, well, it's not really a selfie. I, did, I actually preached at Barrett's Chapel. It's a historic Methodist site down in Frederica, and I didn't do a selfie there because um, I wanted to prove that I was in the pulpit. Um, I'm calling this a churchy. So, everybody wave, everybody wave, one. All right. All right, thanks. I posted the, a picture of the first service up on my Facebook page, and I posted the second service. It's good to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back. Uh, I was here last year. It was actually uh, the last weekend in August. It was the day that Hope Church launched. And so Pastor John asked me to come and preach. And I, I felt very honored because I know um, he's pretty selective about who he invites uh, to be in the pulpit. And so I was honored about that. And I was honored to be invited back. Um, I was actually scheduled to be here October, the first weekend in October for World Communion Sunday. But then he emailed me about a month in advance and said he didn't want me. Um, so I said, okay. And then he emailed me back and said, could you come in November? And I said, sure. Um, I visit probably two dozen churches a year, and I don't always get invited back. So um, it's nice to be invited back every once in a while. Every year. And this is, this is a great service. This is the, this is the way that I like to worship. Um, I, like, I like traditional, um, but I prefer uh, to worship in this town, so it's good to be here. Um, I also, um, you know, anytime I'm asked to visit a church, I go because it's my opportunity to share about the Comet. And, and so that's what I'll do first, and then I'll, I'll get to the message. So if you don't know about the Comet, we are the camp that serves the Peninsula Delaware Conference of the United Methodist Churches on the Eastern Shore of Maryland and the state of Delaware. And we're located in Centerville, Maryland. It's about an hour and a half from here, uh, southwest. We're on the Chester River. We have 275 acres, and it's just a, it's a beautiful place. It's, a, it's just like, um, it's like God has given this land to our conference uh, for people to come and connect with God. We have 4,000 feet of shoreline on the river. That's, it's just an amazing, it's priceless, it's priceless. We could not afford to buy this piece of property that people with vision back, back in 1946 said, you know, we're going we're gonna to make this holy place, this sacred ground uh, to serve the church, to serve God. So that's, we're there. Um, and I'll talk about the camp in a minute, but what many of you don't know is that we serve adults year-round. Um, we do have cabins with bunk beds, and we do have dorm-style facilities that uh, have air conditioning and heat and, and shared bathrooms. But we also have a hotel facility. We have uh, uh, what we call the Riverview Retreat Center. We have 24 hotel-style uh, bedrooms with two queen beds in a room and a private bath. And wire wireless internet throughout. It's not real fast. Um, we don't even get cable where we are. We're at the end of the road. Um, but, but we do have internet. 
Um, and if, have any of you been on a walk to Emmaus weekend? Okay, all right. If you've been on one recently, you've stayed at the retreat center. Um, if you were before, you probably had to stay in one of those bunk beds. Um, but if, if you've not been on a walk to Emmaus weekend, I would encourage you to think about it, to pray about it. Um, it, it was very, I went in 1990, and it was instrumental in my call to ministry. I'm not, I don't want to scare you. You're not going to, you know, just because you go doesn't mean you'll be called into ministry necessarily. Um, but you will be called to do something. God will work on your heart. Um, and that's, you know, each of us um, has a place as a disciple, as a way God wants us to serve in the world. And I think the gift of Walk to Emmaus is that it helps us to, to kind of think about that and learn about how God might want to use us to do things for God, uh, which is what we're all about as Christians. So anyway, that's one of the things we do. We do retreats year-round. Um, we have a confirmation retreat. If, you're, uh, if any of you are involved in the confirmation class with your kids, we do it to help uh, uh, youth and adults come and learn about our Westland tradition. We have a program called Top Chef Pocomath. Um, our uh, Chef Chris, who was trained at the Culinary Institute of America, actually, uh, he's, he provides all our food at the retreat center. Uh, he actually trains adults on you know, how to use a knife and, and how to take apart a whole chicken and uh, make this and that. It's really, it's really cool, and it's, it's got a spiritual basis to it, you know, because uh, food in the Bible uh, kind of is the way that we connect with each other, you know, around that banquet, around that meal. So the, the, yeah. they go on and on and on, pacomath.org. If you want to find out more about uh, what we do, pacomath.org. It's all on the website. You know, that's kind of how we connect nowadays. Um, we're here for you. We're here for you to become a disciple of Jesus Christ who helps go out and transform the world for him. But summer camp. Summer camp is the center of what we do. It always will be. Uh, we serve kids from after kindergarten all the way up to after 11th grade. So basically any young person can come to camp in one form or another. And, you know, camp is countercultural nowadays. It is not what young people think of uh, for a week in the summer. It's outside. There's not air conditioning. There's no screens at all. Well, we actually, the windows have screens in them. But, you know, the kind that let air in. But none of these screens. We don't, we don't have, we ask them to leave their cell phones at home. And we don't have computers to check Facebook, and um, Instagram and all that. You know, Instagram on here. Um, no screens. We ask them to unplug so that they can plug into God. It's interesting because there was a study uh, done by UCLA this summer that was released, and they took two groups of sixth graders, and one of them went to a camp for five days, no screens. And the other did the normal stuff that uh, middle sixth graders do. Um, the average uh, American child and youth spend seven and a half hours a day on electronic media. TV, cell phones, computers, video games, yeah, seven and a half hours. Well, I mean, this all counts, okay? That counts. When you're doing this, that counts. When you're looking down and not up, that counts. So then after, they, after the kids came back from camp, all these kids took a test, and it was uh, still pictures and, and soundless video, uh, silent video, and what they were asked to recognize facial expressions, to tell emotion, happiness, sadness, anger, you know, all confusion. And the kids who went to camp showed a significant improvement in their ability to recognize nonverbal cues. And the kids who didn't go to camp did not. Now, are we surprised? No. We're not surprised, right? And look, I, I, this, I do this all the time. So I get it. It's the world we live in. But if we're not teaching our kids how to have real relationships with real people, we're letting them down. And that's what camp does. Camp helps them to connect with God and to connect with other people in ways that will serve them beyond the church and into the world. So um, I always make a plug after the service. Uh, if you want to give to our camp, um, we have envelopes back there. Last year I made a shameless plug. I had these green bags and I was selling them for 25 bucks. Uh, I'm just asking you to pray about giving to camp and supporting us. I, I want to specifically mention that we, uh, we awarded $67,000 in scholarships this year to 246 campers. We only had 907 campers over seven weeks, so over a quarter of them, right, almost 30% received a scholarship. 
And of those 246, 124 of them came on a program where their, their family only had to pay $50. And you can actually do that too. So if you're in ministry in the community, and there's a family in need, your church can get them into that program for 50 bucks. You just have to certify that they're from a family in need. So that's the kind of thing that you can support. Um, the envelopes are there. Take it home, pray about it. Praying is always a, a, giving is always a spiritual thing. You know, you can mail it back in. But uh, I just want to share with you the difference that we see camp makes. And, and I always share about letters I received from kids who received scholarships. Uh, this year I received letters from two sisters, Jane and Danielle. They actually go to my church in Chesapeake City. Uh, Jamie's a junior in high school and Danielle's a sophomore. And uh, Jamie, Jamie's amazing. She's gone to our director's leadership program at camp. Uh, she's a, she has taken a leadership position in the church. Uh, she she um, does stuff in school. She's preached in the Spit in the Word contest at the youth rally. I mean, she just, you know, she's a future leader. She decided this summer that she wanted to go to Messiah College, Christian College, and has a call to ministry. So that's, that's you know, yes, that's what we're about. But it's a le letter from Danielle that really got me. Uh, Danielle wrote that she has always lived under Jamie's shadow. You know, younger sister, and Jamie's a high achiever, doing all the right things. And, and she wrote in her letter, you know, I always try to do what she does because I, I want to be like her. And she said, this year at camp, I realized that God loves me for who I am. And I do not have to be like Jane. I can be myself. And when she, and she wrote, when I got back, I, I stopped trying to be like other people, and I found a new group of friends, and they're helping me grow in my faith. So, you know, that's, yeah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. That is what camp is about. So we know this church sends campers. We, you share your pastors with us for a week. They help us with our Bible studies. They come up all charged up. I don't know, have you ever talked to them after a week at camp? Yeah. They're unbearable, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> but we love it. We love it. And we, we just want to continue that partnership so that young people have that opportunity to grow in their faith, that they can become disciples who change the world. Okay, now time for the message. And uh, I confess this at the first service. Actually, I've been confessing this everywhere I go this year. Um, I, had, I have preached this sermon before. This is not the first time I've preached it, so um, I'm just sharing. You're not the first, okay? And, and it's before 9 o'clock I preached it. I visit, like I said, about two dozen churches a year. I've been at Becomber for 15 years, and um, for the first seven years, I think, seven or eight years, every Sunday when I, when I would visit a church, I would look at the lectionary for that, for that week. That's the lectionary is a cycle of scriptures, and I would pick out a scripture, and I would prepare a sermon. Two dozen sermons a year, which doesn't sound like much. Your pastor probably does twice that. Um, I like I like getting into the Word, and I like looking for a nugget that you know that God can provide for the people of God. But I realized about eight years ago that I didn't have time for that. We were just starting the capital campaign for the retreat center, and you know it's like, well, I'm not a pastor, so they don't pay me. They don't give me any time to prepare a sermon. They pay me to run a camp. And then it came to me. What if I have one good sermon a year? Who would know? Right? <laughs> Unless I told them. And so about seven years ago, I started preparing one sermon and preaching that. And, and I share that with you because I really take it seriously. At the beginning of every year, I pray, Lord, what is it that you want your people to what is it that you want your churches to hear? The churches that you're going to send me to visit, do you have a message for them? And this week, it took this year it took about two weeks of praying, and this is the passage that came to me. And I believe this is God's word that God wanted me to share. So what Len read has traditionally been called the parable of the goats and the sheep. And uh, there are goats and there are sheep in it. Um, it's not really a parable, though. Uh, a parable it takes an ordinary thing and then kind of spins it into an extraordinary message, like the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, right? A little tiny seed that grows into this amazing thing, this huge thing. That's a parable. This is more of a vision. It's a description of what the end of time is going to look like when Jesus returns. And the passage tells us that when he does, he's going to take the entire world, all the people in the world, and bring them together, and he's going to divide them into two groups. 
The sheep are going to be at his right, and the goats at his left, and the sheep are going to heaven, and the goats are going the other way, and there's one criterion for getting into heaven. How well did you serve the needy? When I read that passage, the first question that comes to my mind is, how will we be judged? How will our church be judged? How will the United Methodist Church be judged? But then if you think, okay, you know, the Bible's a big book, right? And there's a lot of messages in the Bible. And if you've studied scripture for a while, if you've been around the church for a while, you know that Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Right? And Paul tells us in Ephesians that we are saved by grace through faith. Right? Not of our own works so that anybody can boast. And this passage, if this is the way we get into heaven, it, it it's kind of feels like works, right? That we're earning our way into heaven by doing good deeds, by serving the needy. So what's going on? Well, that's the fun part of digging into Scripture. Because digging into Scripture, you've you got to look at the context in the book of the Bible, in this case Matthew, and you've got to look at the context for the early church, when this was first shared with followers of Jesus. So the first one, the, first, the context in the book of the Bible. This comes at the end of chapter 25, and it, there's two chapters, 24 and 25, all about the end of time. And there were parables in there, like the parable of the ten bridesmaids, where five have their lamp oil ready for the bridegroom and five fall asleep. And, and there's images of, of two workers in the field, and one is taken away and the other is left behind. And, and there's the image of, of, of the end of time, Jesus coming back like a thief in the night. And there are two themes in this section. One is... Jesus is coming back. He's going to fulfill all of his promises. And we need to be prepared. Whatever that means. And the second theme is, nobody knows the day or the time. Jesus is coming back. Nobody knows when. The context in Matthew's church is a little bit different. We know that that Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew was written about 40 years after Jesus lived on the earth. And so what we know about that Christian community, that specific community, is that there were many people there who did not see Jesus in the flesh. Now some of them, Matthew being one of them, and some other followers of Jesus who were there when Jesus was alive were still living, but not many. Most of the church were people who had not seen Jesus in bodily form. And they knew that Jesus was coming again. They were pinning their hopes that Jesus would one day come again and fulfill all of God's promises. The kingdom of God would become reality on earth as it is in heaven. But those people in Matthew's church were asking this question. How do we see Jesus? You know, you saw him back then. We'll all see him in the future. But we want to see him now. How do we see Jesus now? And Matthew shares this story that Jesus shared to let them know the answer. If you want to see Jesus, you'll find him in the faces of the least and the last and the lost. Do you want to see I do. I want to see Jesus. This passage made me think of um, a guy named Danny Dunn. Uh, my first pastor started in 1991. It was Hopewell Church in Port Deposit, Maryland, Cecil County. And we had been there probably about a year, and Danny showed up at the house asking for help. He was hungry. We gave him some money. He got some food. He showed up about a week later. And he said that um, his mother was sick in his hometown in Tennessee, and he needed money to get home to see her. And so that following Sunday, he came to church with me, and we had an offering. 
And we raised money to send him home to his mother in Tennessee. You know what I mean? I was young, 31 years old. I was naive, right? Well, after the service, the people were really gracious too. After the service, several people from the church came up to me and they said, you know, you need to watch out for Danny. This is what he does. He just goes around from place to place that so you probably ought to stay with him. That was probably good advice. But somehow I couldn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of it was this passage, but you know, something in my heart was saying, help him. And that became, that became about a four-year saga of life with Danny Dunn. <laughs> um, you know, we would help him out. I became his custodian for his SSI disability, so his checks would come to me, and then I would give his money to him a little bit at a time. I helped him get a Section 8 apartment in Rising Sun. He was eligible. He lived in our basement for a winter after he was kicked out of there because he was caught with drugs. I bailed him out of jail in Chester, Pennsylvania on a Friday night. You ever been in Chester, Pennsylvania at 2 a.m.? Yes, you have. Okay. It's an interesting place. Took him to three different mental hospitals to try to get him help. One of them, I, 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 was, I, I tried, took him in and they said, you know, wait here, we got to evaluate him, so don't leave. So I sat there for about an hour and they came out and they said, um, we can't accept him, he's not stable. I was like, are you kidding me? Of course he's not stable. That's why I brought him here. His doctor told me, I talked to his doctor one time, and his doctor said, you know, Danny can't control his anger because he has scar tissue on his brain from being beaten as a child. And I remember, remember Danny telling me um, one time, he said, you know, my dad used to beat me, and when he beat me, he would yell at me, you'll never amount to nothing. Danny said, you know, he was right. Well, in 1996, we uh, were assigned to Chesapeake City, and we moved, and that kind of ended our time with Danny. And about nine months later, I heard that he had been found dead in the bathroom of the Acme Rising Sun. 46 years old, dead of an apparent heart attack. And, you know, that got me really thinking and struggling. Did we make a difference? Did what we, you know, did what we do make a difference in Danny's life? And I, you know what, I couldn't answer. Couldn't answer. But I remember thinking this. He made a difference in ours. Amen. There were time after time I can literally remember looking at him and saying, "I'm looking in the face of Jesus. Do you want to see?" I believe God gave me this passage to preach this year because I really believe, and I didn't know that at the time, I started to think this in the, in the spring, and now I believe it with all my heart. I believe that the future of the church depends on this. And I'll tell you why. We are losing generation after generation of young people to the world. Baby boomers, gone. Generation Xers, gone. Millennials, going. The next generation, where they're calling them iKids or digital natives, we're going to lose them too. And here's why. Survey after survey tells us young people say they love Jesus, but they hate the church. They love Jesus, but they hate the church. Don't get offended. Because it's not this they hate. And I, as I told the 9 o'clock service, it's not traditional worship that they hate. Some young people prefer that. My daughter's one of them, but my second daughter, she's 27. I guess that's young. It's young to me. Here's what they hate. They hate all the other stuff that goes on in the church. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes we bicker. Sometimes we say we've never done that way, done it that way before. You know, it only takes a few years for somebody to become a tradition in a church. And, you know, you might only been here a few years, and then somebody else comes along and wants to do something new, and you say, no, nah, I like it the way it is. I attend church in Chesapeake City, and probably six or seven years ago, we had this huge brouhaha. No, no fists, no, no yelling and screaming, but a lot of tension, because some people wanted to move the meat slicer in the kitchen 
during the roast beef supper because we didn't use it anymore. We had this roast beef sliced at the local restaurant. And the kitchen committee brought the hammer down and there was a little sign that showed up on the meat slicer that said, the meat slicer shall not be moved by order of the kitchen committee. <laughs> That's us, right? That's us. I own up to it. Young people want to meet Jesus. They want to know, you know, if they read about Jesus and they say, man, this guy is amazing. He loved everybody. He reached out to the least in society. He made it, he was a radical, right? He was against the establishment. <laughs> and they come to church, and it feels more like establishment. But what if we were so out in our community meeting the needs of people that they could see Jesus? When uh, we were in Chesapeake City in 1999, we founded the Generation Station Youth Center. And uh, it's an after-school program for at-risk kids. And it's a really cool thing. They come and they get help with homework, and they get character education, and they have fun, and they, they make friends, and, and they, they stay safe. And it's still going today. Uh, my wife still volunteers there every day after. And every, every year, uh, every month, we have a, a reward field trip for kids that have attended at least 60% the month before, have made the honor roll, or had perfect attendance at school. And about three, three, four years ago, one of the field trips, it was one of my favorite, that we took was to Washington, D.C. And we took them to lunch at a place called Ben's Chili Bowl, which is in Northeast D.C. It's this iconic African-American chili joint that, that presidents and movie stars and anybody, they have pictures all over the wall of famous people who have eaten there. We, we actually got to meet Mrs. Ben. Ben died, I don't remember his, their last name. But, um, and, and then we took them to the National Zoo, which is, a, again, this amazing place that if you're from Cecil County, I mean, you can't even imagine. And on the way home, we stopped along Route 50 at a restaurant, and we had dinner. And after dinner, we piled into our, we had two big vans, I'm driving one of them, and I'm looking in the rearview mirror, driving down Route 50, and I see this little girl, Courtney, sixth grader, and she's on her phone, and she's saying, Mom, we had the most amazing dinner. We had cloth napkins, and beautiful silverware, and appetizers, and the dinners came on these huge plates, and the desserts were incredible. And she's going on and on and on, and I'm thinking to myself, this is Olive Garden. So, what do we take for granted? And I remember thinking to myself as I'm looking back at Courtney on the phone, I'm looking at the face of Jesus. Do you want to see Jesus? I, I, when I do this, I read the bulletins. You've got ways already waiting for you. As Len said, come to Thanksgiving dinner. They need help cleaning up, but more than that, come and sit down and eat. Look Jesus in the face. We have two different food closets in this community that need food, they need money, but maybe they need help actually passing out food. Being there to be the hands and feet of God when somebody shows up. There are all kinds of ways that you can meet Jesus in the community. And, and here's what I'll challenge you to do. If you want to see Jesus, I'll ch I challenge you to just pray earnestly and fervently. Lord, how can I find you in our community in the faces of the least and the last and the lost? I guarantee you, if you start praying that, God is going to show you so many ways. And you'll be blessed Last story. So, I was at the youth rally this last January. We're there every year. Anybody been to the youth rally? Anybody? Okay. The youth rally, one courageous adult. The youth rally is 4,000 people at the Ocean City Convention Center, two-thirds of them youth, one-third of them courageous adults. 
And we usually have a, a booth there. We have a booth every year recruiting staff and recruiting campers. And I was taking a break. I was walking out into the foyer from the exhibit hall, and I heard, Mr. Jack! Now, I only hear Mr. Jack in a couple different contexts. See, because most people call me Pastor Jack, or Reverend Jack, or just Jack. If I hear Mr. Jack, it's either somebody I coached in youth sports, I coached football, basketball, baseball, or somebody from the Generation Station Youth Center. So I wheel around, and it's Courtney, this little girl from the Generation Station, except for she's not little anymore, she's my height. And she's in ninth grade, and I haven't seen her for a couple years, because like a lot of kids at the youth center, their families move on, they're kind of transient, they go from place to place. And I say, Courtney, how are you? She said, I'm doing great. We moved to Rehoboth area, and I met some friends, and here's one of them, and we go to church together, and we're here at the youth center. Now, I cannot tell you for any certainty whether her time at the youth center made a difference in her life. But I can tell you with God's certainty that seeing her face there was seeing the face of God. Do you want to see Jesus? And she wants to see Amen. Church don't know you're going to love. We're wanted. You're needed in this place. As Pastor Jack has said, you know, our mission field is out those doors. Go out there and you know what? Meet Jesus today. Amen. To fly, to fly.